Hi, I'm Pam, and I would like to welcome you to the Live Authentically show. My team and I help other people step into their authentic realities via a number of different modalities. This podcast is obviously one of them. I have also recently just launched my first book. It's called SOAR, S-O-A-R. It can be found on Amazon, and it's an experiential spiritual journey through my divorce process and shows how I partnered with the universe to create my new reality. We also have a Facebook group, and I would love to have you join us there. We can be found at liveauthentically.today slash FB. And also, I am a spiritual life coach, so I work with individuals and groups to help people step into their fullest potential. So I'm super pumped that on today's show, I have with me Kelly Bramlett. Hey, Kelly. Hi. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to hear um, all about Kelly's story today. She has a very powerful story to share with us about hope, about healing and hope. And she has also just recently released her first book. So congratulations. Thank you. It's called Alchemy of the Phoenix. And she will tell you all about that on today's show. Um, but, be first, be, but before we dive into her story, I first start my shows off with the same question for all of my guests. And that question is, what does it mean to you to live authentically every day? I love this question. Um, for me, living authentically just really means showing up to the world with the same face that I have when I'm in my private time, being integral in my work and in what I do, and really just being comfortable to be myself without really that fear of what other people are thinking or that worry about like how other people are judging me and I have to say it did take a while to get to that point where I was able to show up to the world that way because I had so many fears around that but I'm happy to say that today um, I feel like I do show up that way so Congratulations. I know the work it takes to get to that authentic place. And I would love to hear your story. You know, how did you come to this place? Have you always lived authentically? Or I mean, was there a particular catalyst that or an aha moment where you said, you know what, I think I need to change the way I'm doing things? I think I've always lived authentically to where I was at mentally at that time, if that makes sense. Um, but I don't think I've always lived authentic to my true purpose, my higher calling, and, you know, that's authentic to that alignment that we have to our broader perspective. And that really has been a long road for me, uh, pretty much a lifelong journey that I think we're really all on. But, you know, in my earlier years, I talk about this in my book, it was very much a two step forward, one step back process. And it wasn't really until about 2016 that I really started diving in and doing the work and exploring what, who am I even like, you know, for so long, I, the reason why I'm able to say that I felt like I was living authentically to where I was at during that state of mind. But as I began this healing process, it was really a, a journey of self-discovery. So before I could really step into that authentic role, I really had to spend some time relearning or just learning who I was outside of all of the trauma and the alcohol and everything else that had been plaguing me for so many years. So to answer that short, I would say about 2016 is when I really, really started doing this work. But like I said, it had really been a lifelong process that got me even to that point. Sure. And I'd love to hear um, whatever you're willing to share about, you know, you mentioned alcohol, some of your struggles, because I know that so many of our viewers and listeners can identify with a lot of things that you'd struggled with in your past. So I'd love to kind of open it up for you to talk about any of those areas in the spirit of helping to give other people hope, because I know that so many people, particularly in today's landscape, today's of the, of the world, the pandemic that we're faced with, um, certain problems have been exacerbated, you know, like alcoholism and um, use of drugs and um, certain addictions and compulsions. And um, I would love to hear anything you're willing to share about your story in the spirit of giving others hope. Absolutely. So my story is really, I was sexually abused uh, starting at a very young age. Um, and that first issue of abuse really created a lot of limiting beliefs and stories that I grew up telling myself. And then I was sexually abused a second time um, 
when I was 15, I was sent away to live with family. And so they were very religious. It was a very fanatical um, religion where I was taught to believe in things like second multiple marriages. I was being groomed to be a second wife. Um, I was really brainwashed in all of that religion. And there was a lot of confusion in that situation for me. So I share a lot of this in detail, obviously, in my book. It's part memoir, the first part where I share kind of like in detail um, my own wounding and trauma and that. And that ended up leading to from there because it wasn't something that we ever dealt with. I kind of came out of that situation at 17, 18 around then and never really like dealt with that. We didn't really talk about it too much in my family. And so life just kind of went on, but I was living in this state of unhealed wounding stuff that hadn't been dealt with. And so I, from what I've witnessed, and I tend to believe that any time that anyone's living um, in this type of unhealed wounding, we go on what I call the downward spiral. Um, and I think that often manifests in self-sabotaging behaviors. So for me, that definitely was issues with drug and alcohol, just numbing out, um, and a slew of other things. But definitely alcohol and drugs have played a big part of my story in the past. And so You know, it was really, like I said, that two step forward, one step backwards through all this process and not really knowing what I was doing until about 2016 when I was literally just, you know, at that point broken. I couldn't go on. It was like, it was that point where it's like, I either have to do something now or I'm not going to survive this. Like, I can't survive any longer living, um, you know, and what I was living at that point, I'd lost all three of my children. Um, because I wasn't, you know, a good place for them to be. And so I had all that guilt and all kinds of stuff um, centered around that. And it was just like I said, I I remember I was journaling and I was doing like affirmations and automatic writing. And across the page, the word said, um, I deserve to be happy. And even now when I talk about this, I get very emotional because it's such a simple thing that we're all deserving of. But it really showed me how I had lived up until that point, believing that I somehow wasn't worthy of that joy. And I remember the sound came out of my mouth. It wasn't a scream. It wasn't a cry. I don't know what it was. And I dropped to my knees and I laid there and cried and just released for, I don't know how long. And I just, I was like, I have to do something. It has Something has to change. I can't live this way. And I do deserve this joy. And I just started actively fighting for that joy that I finally was able to accept that I deserved. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. I'd like to echo that for our viewers and listeners that, you know, believing, believing that you're worthy, right? Believing that you're worthy of feeling the joy, believe that you're worthy of being happy. And that's really the question I think that cuts through a lot of it. Life can be messy and complicated. It can be hard to sift through kind of all the chaos sometimes, regardless of what our situation is. But that's really the question that kind of cuts to the heart of it, isn't it? You know, are you happy? are we happy? You know, I ask all of my clients that, are you happy? And sometimes they think they were, but when they're asked that question point blank, I mean, that has a very black and white response, right? You either are or you aren't. There's no, well, I'm kind of, you know, it really does um, help to crystallize a lot of things. So I think that that's so important to, um, to realize that whatever your situation is, you're entitled to happiness. You're entitled to joy. Absolutely. I was agree. Was there a part on your journey that was what was the hardest part? Was there a, a, a rock bottom? I mean, was it that moment where you just you were sobbing for hours and just had this release? Or what was the most challenging moment on your journey? You know, I don't know. I honestly almost feel like the most challenging part of the journey happened after the healing started because, you know, you begin to step into that awareness all of a sudden. Like I said, I had lived very numbed out and not really present and you know, it was definitely tough when I was living in that downward spiral. I um, continued to attract people that re-enacted that abuse that I had experienced. And so, I mean, the entire thing, it was almost like being re-traumatized over and over. Um, so that downward spiral period was definitely hard and it was definitely like depleting to my soul and difficult. But by far, I would say, I think that the majority of the difficultness and really came in, like I said, once I began that healing and then I really was sitting there like 
trying to sort it all out, trying to make sense of it, trying to deal with like the um, enormous amount of guilt. Because I mean, like I said, I was drinking, I was numbing out. So I wasn't feeling all of those emotions. And then all of a sudden I start getting healthy and it's like, I got bombarded with years worth of guilt about, you know, the kind of mother I'd been and, and all these things. So I think it was just that initial, like getting started. That was probably the most, like <gasps> almost took my breath away. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are in that position where they're numbing themselves out day after day. And I'd love to spend some time talking about this because um, you know, it's hard to break old patterns, right? It's hard to put the alcohol aside or, or not go for the drugs to numb out. But what do you say to the people who are scared to stop numbing out, right? Who are scared, you know, to start becoming aware and awake <clears throat> and starting to feel parts of themselves that they haven't been able to come to terms with? What can you say to sort of to coax them into that courageous place? Well, I think the first thing I would say is just offer like um, some support that it does get better because I remember there were times when I, I've been with my fiance now for three years, but when we first got together, I was still very much living in that unhealed space. I was still drinking very heavily, but it was getting to that point where I was like, okay, I know this is something I'm, I was on the road to um, recovery, I guess you could say, but we would have conversations where I would actually be in tears thinking about what my life was going to be like in the absence of alcohol, because it's almost like you're losing your best friend. You're losing your greatest comfort. I started thinking about things like, well, what about when, when I get married? What about for holidays? All these excuses of like, well, I can't do this without alcohol that when you know, all these crazy things. And now looking back, we have a good chuckle at this because I love sobriety. I'm planning my wedding now and I'm so excited about experiencing that presence and just being there and enjoying it. And I have to say that, you know, it seems really scary when you're in that place because you become so dependent on something. But once you get past that initial hurdle of the withdrawals and the psychological withdrawal aspect that lasts really just a very short time, you know, and it really does, um, you start to feel so good. Your relationships begin to improve. Your life circumstances begin to improve. Your clarity, your health, everything begins to improve, which becomes in itself very motivating to stick to um, to stick on stick to it. You know. So I think the biggest thing I would tell people is just know that where you're at right now is not the mindset that you would be in in a year from now. Um, without that drugs or alcohol or whatever it is in your life. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, what kind of support systems are available for people when they, you know, if they don't know where to turn, you know, what do you think, where can they go to take that first step to get help into sobriety? Well, you know, this is kind of an interesting question because I'm not personally, and I do talk about this in my book, a huge supporter of 12 step programs. Like I know they do work, but statistically, you know, they work for about 5% of people. And so I think that in itself says that like somehow there's like a missing key. And I think the thing is that I've discovered is that all of my life I was struggling with alcohol and drugs and <clears throat> I was focused on it. I've been in and out of AA rooms and in a rehab for the last 20 years. And it was all focused on the lack of alcohol in your life, the lack of this thing. You're counting days, you're counting chips, you're doing all these things. And people often ask me, how did you finally quit? And I finally quit because I stopped trying to quit. And I know that sounds really counterproductive. But what I started doing instead is focusing on what do I want to bring into my life as opposed to what am I trying to take out of my life? And I started doing things that were healthy for me. I started a morning spiritual practice that then started making me feel really good. So then that night before all of a sudden, I, I would say, you know, I don't really want to drink tonight because I want to feel good for my practice because this practice is sustaining me throughout my whole day and is kind of filling that space. And as I brought more of these positive habits into my life, I lost interest in the alcohol. I lost interest in numbing out. I started loving the way I felt. I started understanding things on a level that made it where I didn't feel like I needed that crutch any longer. And I had other healthier tools like prayer, meditation, and different things like this that I could turn to when things felt overwhelming or stressful rather than running to that drink. And so 
you know, I think the first thing is if you're at that rock bottom time, do go to a meeting. There is a place for those programs, um, definitely, and I've utilized them, and there's so much support and help and hope in those rooms. But I personally just feel like that it's never truly the self-sabotaging behavior that's the problem. It's getting to the underneath. Why do you need to drink so much? Why do you feel like you need that crutch? And so I feel like in those programs, there's not often people who are qualified enough necessarily to handle all of the issues that come with that underneath wounding. And so I say, you know, I tend to say, get some help dealing with what's causing you to want to drink as opposed to the actual drinking like what wounds need to be addressed that are causing that manifestation of of that addiction and self-sabotaging behavior great great advice and guidance um so do you suggest more of an individualized approach then i mean are you an advocate for therapy for individual therapy I think that these things are really as individual as each of us are. And I think that everything is different things are going to work for different people. You know, I know a lot of people who have been sober for 40, 50 plus years going to AA meetings and that's obviously has worked for them. For them personally, for me and from my experience, I would recommend a more personalized experience with that one-on-one because you are dealing with someone who, A, who has kind of the knowledge, the experience, and the education to really help you unpack those more serious issues. Um, So all I can speak to is for me personally, but um, my viewpoint, I do kind of am a proponent of that more personalized care and recovery and healing. Mm -hmm. I have, I love, I absolutely love your story. I mean, not only that you've been able to work through these issues and get yourself to a place of sobriety, but that you've been able to transmute all of that pain and you are, you're, you've turned it into a gift to the world. I mean, you inspire people on a daily basis and give them hope. I mean, you've got a book, you're, you've you know, left this indelible mark on this earth, you know, this gift to this earth, you know, vault that will live on forever and ever, this story of healing and hope, which I think is so absolutely amazing. Um, so what was, was there a moment that you said, you know what, I need to do something more. Like I need to share my story? Was there a particular thought or experience that you had where you really, where you said, you know what, I need to go big with my story? You know, that's interesting in itself because there really wasn't. I had started, um, I had quit my job working in bars because obviously that wasn't very copacetic any longer to the direction of my life. And I started making handmade jewelry made out of gemstones. Um, And really that was it. And somehow all of this kind of snowballed and I ended up sharing my story because I won a contest. Um, I was on the internet and a lovely woman who I've been following her work named Emma Mumford. She was asking, running a contest, looking for spiritual authors. And I had never thought about writing a book before, but as soon as I saw that across my entire body covered in chills. So that's my sign spirits trying to get my attention. So I said, okay, I wrote her, what do we need to do? And she said, well, just send over your book proposal and then it will be reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I've never written a book proposal. I'm getting on Google, like, how do I write a book proposal? And then I just went to prayer and I said, you know, I feel that you're calling me to do this. I have no idea what you would like me to write about, what I should write about. If this is something that's meant for me, I'm gonna just leave it here with you and I'm gonna go about my day. And within an hour, the entire book had been put in my head. Um, The outline was created. The book proposal was sent. She called me the very next day. She said, I feel really called that I need to have a conversation. Let's set up a time to talk. And I signed my book deal the next week. So it all happened very, um, very, very quickly. And really out of the blue and shocking. So, Wow, that's amazing. And that's just such a testament to, you know, when, when we step into our purpose, when we're aligned with what we're meant to do, there is an organicness and an ease. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just kind of unfolds organically and effortlessly. I mean, not to say that you don't have to bring, you know, effort to it, but, you know, there's just, there's an ease and an organicness to it. So I am so delighted that you have found that place and have shared your gift with the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd love to dive more into lifestyle. You know, you said you've, the focus was about the lack of alcohol and what you couldn't do and what was what you were taking out of your life. But I love your approach of focusing on 
what you now could do, right? What focusing on what you're stepping into or focusing on what you could replace the alcohol with that was nourishing your mind, your body, and your spirit. Because I think that in general in society, you know, we're not necessarily taught those things. I think in our in our society, um, we're trained to be more reactive, right? Mm-hmm. Just you know, just kind of eat the way that we we want to eat it in a way that pleases us in the moment, and then you know, and then react by you know, we're in that reactive state of wanting to lose weight or we're dealing with health issues. But there's this whole, there's such power in taking this preventative and proactive approach by building a lifestyle that nurtures our mind, body, and spirit. So I'd love to hear more about those. You've mentioned your spiritual practice and what are some other lifestyle practices that you have found to be um, helpful to lead you to where you are? Well, like I said, um, my daily spiritual practice, it's something that is non-negotiable and that's been key because I think it's so easy for us to get in these really good um, patterns of something and then something happens and we fall out and we fall out and then before we know it, we've kind of lost our momentum. And so very early on, I made my um, morning spiritual practice a non-negotiable part of my day. Now that doesn't mean that every single day I spend an hour or two. Sometimes it is just 20 minutes of gratitude and prayer, but whatever that is, I make sure that I'm starting my day in that really aligned space that Mm -hmm. sustains the rest of the day. Um, So that probably is like the number one thing that I ushered in. And from there, you know, that really creates the space in our life for all other things to come to us. It's in that space where we are in that like perfect energy of allowance really and in that dialogue with the universe where so many other things are able to be funneled into our life through that space that we created so you know that and i mentioned gratitude which is also another part you know i will vary in the different things that i do whether it's meditation or kundalini chanting one day or all different kinds of practices but one practice that i think that we uh, is the most important is practicing gratitude every single day, you know, starting my day out with gratitude. I like, you can see this board behind me, which I usually don't interview in this room, but I've mentioned we're moving, but I keep a whiteboard um, where pretty much mainly I will only see it, but throughout the day is like good things happen no matter how little or large they are. I go and jot them down on that board. And then at the end of the week, I stand there and I take pause and I look at all of the beautiful, wonderful, amazing things that we forget about. And I mean, I, like I said, I write the tiniest things on there, whether it's just like a, a beautiful moment I shared with my family where we were all like joyous and laughing and you know, whatever that is, because I say there's never anything too small to celebrate. If something good happens, if something makes you feel good, celebrate it. You know, we don't need these giant things to celebrate. So I think just switching that mentality into like this, always looking for gratitude, always looking for the good, always looking for the abundance that's coming into my life. That's a game changer. Yeah, I agree. I'd like to echo that. And that really is the gateway to everything that we want, right? All of the peace and love and abundance and everything that we want in this world is really through gratitude and appreciation, right? It's about, like you said, it's about the little things. Mm -hmm. And I always say for people who are feeling hopeless or feeling like they're at rock bottom, find the best feeling thought you can in the moment, whatever it is, find something to appreciate. Even if it's just the sky, right? Maybe even nothing, nothing in your life. Maybe you, you can look up and you can just say, you know what? I appreciate the sky today. That's all I can find, but find that one thing and hold on to that as long as you can. Mm-hmm. And that will start to gain momentum. And then you'll be able to hold that thought a little bit longer. And then before you know it, you'll be starting to shift your mindset over time. But um, it's, it's important to just start and, and just even if you're feeling hopeless, find something. I agree. I like to keep like little pictures of like baby animals and stuff that really gives me those like um, warm, fuzzy feelings. And so throughout the day, if I notice like, mm, you know, something's feeling off or so, something happened that kind of has thrown me a little bit out of alignment, just even having those quick things to go. And like, if you can just bring yourself to a smile, something that makes you want to smile, you've already got the ball now rolling in the right direction just with that one little shift in energy. And as far as your spiritual practice goes, I know that it's highly individual. Everybody, everybody's looks different, but for someone, some of our viewers and listeners who may be thinking about instituting a spiritual practice in their life, how can they start? Can you kind of give us a menu of certain things that they can select from um, to begin their practice? 
Yeah. Like I said, gratitude, obviously, but for me, I do a mixture of things. I go outside um, in the mornings as the sun is rising and I do some sun salutations, some breath work, just really start my day connecting to my body, to my breath, um, welcoming in the light, so to speak of that day. So I do that. I do a lot of um, kundalini yoga and chanting. I have developed such a love for um, chanting and that type of meditation. So that's definitely a big part of my practice. Journaling is huge. I mean, I've journaled my entire life and I just think anyone who is, you know, on this path needs to have a journal. That's all there is to it because it's such a wonderful tool. You know, I also work with Oracle cards, crystals, candles. I love writing rituals. Um, for different things like different moon cycles or different all kinds of things like that. So I do a lot of ritual um, to, to facilitate that connection. But really what I tell people too is like, it's so, like you said, individualized. So even just turning on a piece of music that really makes you feel uplifted as a spiritual practice, you know, singing your guts out is a spiritual practice. So really for me, it's just doing those things that make you feel good and consistently looking for those things as you go through your day that really make you feel good. Yeah, I would echo that as well. It's just, again, finding that joy, right? Doing things that make you it's all about the feeling, right? That's how we invite other, other amazing things into our life is about feeling good, right? I always say that's the best kept secret is that everything we want is, comes to us through our emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's the best thing we can do is, is feel as, as good as possible in every single moment. Absolutely. So, sharing that. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you do professionally. I know you're, you're an author, you're, um, you know, you're get working on getting your book out there, but what else? I would love to hear what else you do in order to um, help others? Well, I'm a Reiki master teacher. So I teach Reiki, I practice distant Reiki, and I also do energy coaching, which where I use Reiki, but I kind of work with my clients um, on an energetic level. We the chakras, we kind of see, we figure out where we maybe need to work on in those chakras. So that's one aspect of my coaching. And then I also do shadow work and trauma recovery for people who have had similar experiences to mine, whether it's sexual abuse or just whatever that trauma is, but kind of has suffered some pretty heavy trauma. And I help people kind of sort through that, kind of dig it out a little bit and begin that healing process. So I do, I offer those types of coaching and then the Reiki. And then of course I, I have my book, of course, like you mentioned. Yeah. So what types of trauma do you help people with? Really anything, because the thing is, is that we all experience it. That's really the truth. And something I've learned along this journey is that trauma isn't measured by how our human minds view the um, extremeness of it, so to say. So mm -hmm. trauma energetically vibrates the same in all of us. So my worst trauma, for example, will feel the same to you as your worst trauma or any, you know, our trauma all vibrates the same within us. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, I don't really think we get through this life without experiencing some amount of that trauma. So for me, I work with people who have experienced any trauma, but it's mainly people who have um, been living for long periods of time in that unhealed trauma who are really at that place like I was where they are like, ready to get down, do the work, heal the trauma, but they're not really sure where to start. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just provide, you know, a blueprint <clears throat> for that process for them. And then obviously provide them support while they go through that. Because like I had mentioned, that healing process was almost the most difficult time for me because there was so much showing up and it was very overwhelming. And so I kind of just come in and hold space for people as they're beginning to process through all of that stuff. And what about the people who haven't um, experienced, um, you know, extreme trauma in their life, like the trauma that you had mentioned earlier in your, in your life? What about people who, though, in their adulthood find that they keep kind of tripping over the same issues, same patterns are ensuing, but, you know, they can't remember. I mean, they kind of had a, you know, a rosy childhood, you know, nice house and family, white picket fence, all of that. How do you help them unpack? Because we all have where I'm going is, you know, obviously, as you know, we all have childhood 
wound, so to speak, right? We all have early childhood experiences which imprinted certain things on our belief system and we carry those with us into our adulthood. And until we heal them, we're going to be perpetuating the same patterns and the same issues. So how do you help someone unpack their life, unpack their wounds when they come to you and say, but I can't really remember any, any early traumatic experiences? Well, you know, it's really interesting because I'm actually in training right now um, for this informed trauma care um, clinical certification. And they talk about how we don't necessarily like it. This whole time in therapy, we've been told you need to delve into your wounds. You need to remember them in great detail. It's the only way to heal. But this new way of looking at trauma therapy kind of says you don't really need to remember. We just need to address what the manifestation is. And okay. so as a law of attraction practitioner, I really bring a lot of mindset work in um, when maybe there's patterns or blocks that we can't necess necessarily identify right off the bat. And in those circumstances, I really work on um, more like reprogramming the mind because some of those things that keep showing, some of those patterns really are nothing but habit. They're not necessarily even something that's um, stemming from from a trauma, so to speak, more so it's usually often something that a block that's been created from some kind of limiting belief that we've begun telling ourselves and then we've created that repeating cycle. So mm -hmm. a lot of times we, if we can just get to that limiting belief, pluck that out, de demystify that, write a new story and then work from there creating new habits that form new pathways in the mind that are going to be more supportive. So I do bring a lot of my law of attraction um, practitioner training into all the work I do. I mean, I live by it, obviously. I think, I know you do too. That's why I say obviously, because I've had the pleasure of reading your book. So I know that that's a huge part of your story as well. But like I said, I think sometimes it's just about rewiring, what's creating better habits, you know? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the limiting beliefs that you commonly see when you work with your clients? The worthiness is a huge one. People not uh, underlying feelings of not being worthy, which really, you know, creates a fear that gets in the way of anything we really want to work towards, doesn't it? It's hard to mm -hmm. set goals and really reach those goals. If somewhere there's a limiting belief that you're not worthy of those goals, that's always going to keep you kind of out of arm's reach. So I think that's a, a huge one. And, you know, really, I think it just is all comes down to fear and how that fear shows up in different people, whether it shows up in an anxious way, whether it shows up disguised as all these different emotions. I think when we really get to the crux of it, it's like, where, where is the fear lying in, in what, in your current situation and your current mindset and kind of getting to that fear space and then bringing that out as well. Yeah, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. So I love what you do. I love your story. Um, it's incredibly inspirational. I'm so looking forward to reading your book. So thank you for sending that to me. Um, what are your plans for the future? I know you're a super ambitious person and super committed to making the world a better place. What do you have in store for yourself for the, over the next few years? You know, right now I mentioned to you, I am, I have started my second book, which is really excited. Very beginning stages of that, but that's definitely going to be a huge part of my story this next year, um, as far as my work goes. And from there, I'm kind of just along for the ride at this point. You know, I spent a lot of time kind of consciously manifesting all these certain things, but along the way, I learned that if I just worry about my alignment, um, these amazing things kind of just come to me that were meant for me all along. So I've kind of taken a break on really setting these really specific goals and more so just set my goals on living in alignment, feeling good, and just really being open to receive whatever magic the universe has for me. So I guess it's anyone's guess. We'll just have to see. I love it. I love that open mind, the adventurous spirit. And yes, that is exactly how it works. You know, we're so used to setting goals and, and chasing them down and working to achieve them. And yes, hard work always has to be part of the equation, but it, the magic really is in alignment because when we are aligned with who we are and our purpose, those things find us, right? I mean, they just somehow magically find us. And it is so amazing when we surrender Right? It's all about, it's a process of just surrendering and allowing the universe to do the driving. I mean, that's really the, the sweet spot of life. And I'm delighted that you have found it. So um, 
if people would like to get in touch with you directly, how can they do that? Well, you can visit my website where it's probably the easiest way. I have a form right on the front where people can contact me. So you can um, get to that at www.kellybramblett.com. So really easy, first and last name.com. Um, I also have an Instagram account under I am Kelly Bramblett where you can find me as well. So those are probably the best places. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I so appreciate you being on my show today and sharing your story of healing and hope and Look forward to staying in touch with you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. You're welcome. And to all of our viewers and listeners, I would like to thank you as well. Time is a choice, and I am grateful that you have carved time out of your day to be here with me and Kelly uh, to hear her powerful story of hope and healing. So again, I would love to invite you to join my Facebook group. I, we can be found at liveauthentically.today slash FB. And also, um, next time you're on Amazon, check out um, my book, uh, SOAR, S-O-A-R, and also look for Kelly's book, Alchemy of the Phoenix, as well. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a great day.